Normally, we will do a series that will lead up to a big weekend like Easter, and, um, and then we'll launch into a new series following Easter. We decided to do it a little bit different this year. Um, the Unexpected series is continuing. That's kind of unexpected, actually. And uh, we're going to continue the unexpected series um, for a, a good reason. There are some things that happened following Easter that were just really unexpected. Things that occurred that are really critical, actually, to you and I being able to live the life that Jesus calls us to live. Because we are just not capable of doing that in our own strength, it's not possible. Um, last summer, I had the, the privilege of sailing the San Juan Islands with a group of friends. And we took a 42-foot catamaran, and we sailed the San Juans for seven days. And it was just a fabulous ex uh, experience. If you've never been out in the San Juan Islands, uh, it's uh, out in the Puget Sound, and um, it, it is, it's just gorgeous out there. But we had made reservations for a slip in Roach Harbor um, for an overnight stay. And as we were pulling into Roach Harbor, the wind had picked up, and it was going to make it really challenging uh, to get into the slip that was assigned to us. Uh, fortunately, we had a skipper that was experienced. We had a guy on board that knew what he was doing, and that's always good. And so as we're coming in and approaching the slip, um, he knew that given the wind conditions, we were going to need to keep this vessel under power and into the wind for as long as we possibly could because if you cut back on the engine, the wind's going to take the boat in a direction you don't want it to go. So you want to maintain control of that vessel for as long as you can. And he was going to have to maintain control of it keep it under power into the wind, and then at the last minute, turn, swing the bow around, and then throw the engine in reverse to stop forward momentum. And he says to us on our way in, he says, I'm gonna have to bring it in hot. <laughs> that was code for hang on. And as we are approaching the dock, honestly, I am getting really concerned with the speed in which we're approaching the dock. And the only thing I can think of is this boat is chartered under my name. <laughs> and this is a very expensive vessel. And so he pulls that thing in, whips the bow around, throws it in reverse. Now, fortunately, there were a couple of sailors that saw us coming in and they ran to our slip and they were there for us to toss our line to so that they could get it onto the dock cleat and secure the vessel. And when they got that thing on there and secured the vessel, we all just went, woo, what a ride. Now, I've been a part of some boat stories that did not turn out that well. And I was at the helm. And I was so grateful to have an experienced skipper. In fact, when my heart rate had gone down and we were on the dock and we were just kind of reliving that moment when we were coming in, I said, I was so concerned when I saw how quickly we were approaching the dock and the guys, the other sailors, they went, oh, no, no. Your skipper knew exactly what he was doing. He's a pro. And I went, yeah, well, I'm glad for that because it would have turned out very differently had have I been at the helm. Now, two things that made that story end with a happy ending. Number one, an experienced skipper who knew what he was doing. Number two, some unexpected helpers that ran to our slip so that we could throw them the line and they could secure our vessel. Now, let me just say that in terms of your spiritual journey, you need the same thing. You and I need an experienced skipper 
And we need a companion, a helper, because there are going to be times when we're going to need to be able to throw somebody a line and they can secure us and keep us safe. We need an experienced skipper and we need a companion, an unexpected helper that will show up when we need them. Now, when we decide to cross the line of faith and we say to Jesus, I'm gonna put my trust in you. I'm going to trust uh, in what you did on the cross. I'm gonna trust that all of my sins, past, present, future sins, were nailed to the cross with Christ. I'm gonna put my trust in you. I'm gonna ask that you be the leader of my life. Really what we're saying is I relinquish control. I turn the helm of my life over to you. Now, when you do that, you're turning your life over to an experienced skipper. That's a very, very smart thing to do. In fact, look what Jesus says here in John 8, 12. He says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I'm the light of the world. And if you will follow me, if you'll turn your life over to me, if you will allow me to navigate you, I can navigate you through some very dark seasons because I am the light of the world. I can illuminate your path. I can show you exactly where to go, how to get to your desired outcome. And so when we turn our life over to Jesus, we turn it over to an experienced skipper. But it gets even better than that. Because not only do we have Jesus as an experienced skipper, we have an unexpected companion who's gonna be with us always. Look what it says here in John 14, 16 through 17. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So this spirit, this helper that Jesus says, I'm going to send this helper to you, he'll not only be with you, he's going to be in you. This word helper, it's a Greek word that means to come alongside for support, called in for assistance. Look what Jesus goes on to say in John 16, 7. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate, that's the same word there for helper, the helper won't come. If I go away, then I will send him to you. Now notice, it says, I will send him to you. I will send him. The Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, Spirit, it's more than just a, a power source, okay? We're actually talking about the third person in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And this is our companion who wants to be with us um, from, from now on. And Jesus says, it's better for you that I go away. Now, that just doesn't seem logical, really, upon first Glance, it, it just seems like, really, I mean, Jesus, <laughs> we like hanging out with you. Can you imagine being one of those early disciples and, and Jesus is trying to convince them that it's better that he go away? It's like, no, no, no. We've been with you for three years. We've seen what you're able to do. You are a miracle-working, uh, miraculous guy. We want to hang out with you. What do you mean it's better for us if you go away, no. We remember life when you weren't a part of our lives. We want you to stay with us. But he says, it's better for you that I go away because if I stay here, I can't send the helper. But if I go away, I can send the helper. Now, why is it better? Well, Jesus was actually restricted. He had physical limitations. 
because of his body, because he came in the flesh. And so if he was with Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he couldn't be with the others, right? If he was with someone over here, he couldn't be with them over there. He was actually confined and limited by his physical body. But guess what? The Holy Spirit is not confined by a limited body or a physical body. He can be everywhere all at once. He can be with you. He can be with you. He can be with you. And he can be with you wherever you go forever. It's better for us that Jesus went away and he sent to us this helper. Now, Jesus, after resurrection weekend, actually spent 40 days with his followers following the resurrection. 40 days spending time with them, teaching them about the kingdom of God, showing them many convincing signs. For 40 days he was with them. And at the end of the 40 days, there were no doubts as to who he really was. But then just prior to his ascension, He calls them together. Look what it says here in Acts chapter one, verses four and five. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he says, listen, I don't want you to leave Jerusalem. I'm gonna go away but I want you to stay here. I want you to wait for what the Father has promised. And so that's what they did. (laughs) Because, listen, when someone dies and is raised again, you just do what they tell you to do. I mean, (laughs) right? So they said, okay, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna hang out here and we're gonna wait. Now, the reality is, They really didn't know what they were waiting for. They didn't have anything to really wrap their brain around what it was that was going to happen. But they just knew that he said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem for what the Father has promised. Now, so they're waiting. Now, in the meantime, they're conducting some business. They're, um, you know, Judas was no longer with them as one of the 12 apostles. And so they said, we need to find a replacement. They grabbed a couple of candidates, they cast lots, threw dice. I still think it'd be a great way to select board members, by the way. Um, I'm gonna do that. Before my time here is done, I'm just giving you fair warning. We're gonna roll dice and we're gonna see uh, who gets the, the lot, you know, they're on their way. But they cast lots and they decided Matthias was going to step into that role. But they continue to wait. Now, it says that the, the festival of Pentecost came. Now, this was one of three um, pilgrimage uh, festivals for the Jewish people. There were three that required all Jewish males to make the trek to Jerusalem. Uh, The festival of Pentecost was all about giving thanks to God for a bountiful harvest. And so there were a bunch of people that had flooded into Jerusalem. It happened 50 days after Passover, And so Jesus had been with them for 40 of those 50 days, and so they had now been waiting with Jesus gone. They'd been waiting for 10 days. There's about 120 of them that were just kind of hanging out, waiting for what the Father had promised. And then look what it says here in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. And on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly... There was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues or of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So, so get this. So, so I mean, what a meeting, right? 120 of them, and they're up there, and all of a sudden, it's like, what is that? There's this 
this loud noise like a mighty rushing windstorm, and suddenly there are like flames of fire everywhere just kind of dancing on top of people's heads, and then they all begin to speak in a language that they don't understand. But get this, the Bible says that they didn't understand the language that they were speaking, but all of these people that had come from different regions, all in Jerusalem at that time, they all heard what was being spoken in their own native language. So the people that were speaking didn't understand, but the people who were listening did. Talk about a miraculous moment, right? And so here, here they are, this, um, this Holy Spirit has come and has flooded their lives. So much so that Peter, he stands up and he begins to explain to the crowd that had gathered that were wondering, hey, what is going on here? He gets up and explains what's going on and they're so convicted that they repent of their sins. 3,000 people become followers of Jesus in that moment. Now, now here's what I wanna say. It's not because Peter was that good. It's not like he was like this masterful, eloquent, you know, just was able to articulate it, that he was so convinced. In fact, you know, the Apostle Paul, he later writes, listen, we came into town, we were not articulate. It's not like we were like convincing in speech. We just came with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's it. That's what convinced people. Now, Peter was not that articulate. It's not that he was just like that good. But this same guy who denied Jesus three times before the crucifixion, this same guy that post-crucifixion was huddled behind locked doors in fear of his life, now he stands up under the enablement of the Holy Spirit and he begins to communicate a message that is so powerful that 3,000 people decide to follow Jesus in that moment. It wasn't him. It was the power of the Spirit within him that became this just attractive, compelling, inspiring, convincing aspect of what he was saying. Now, now, now listen to what Paul says to the Romans in Romans 8, 11. And the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. I want, I want you to just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that again. The same spirit that had the power to raise Christ from the dead, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've crossed the line of faith, you've put your trust and faith in what Christ did on the cross for you, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead resides in you, lives in you. Unfortunately, there are many people who live their lives in such a way that it's, they're oblivious to the fact that this powerful spirit lives in them. They try to navigate their life on their own strength, completely unaware of the power that's available to them. I love, the, uh, I love the movie, The Wizard of Oz. I, uh, I watched it from the time I was just a little kid. If I'm honest, there were moments where I had to hide behind the couch as I watched that movie. And there was a time, you know, before, you know, um, streaming and before, you know, uh, DVRs and, you know, watching these things on demand. You could only watch that movie one time a year. Once a year on television, old school, rabbit ears, you know, trying to get the signal, black and white. I, uh, I remember as a kid watching The Wizard of Oz. And you know, Dorothy is in Kansas and she's in her house and the twister comes and picks up her house and lands it in the land of Oz. 
And the entire movie is about Dorothy wanting to go home. And from the beginning of her journey to try to get home, she's given this pair of ruby slippers. And so she's told that the the wizard can help her get home. So she heads out for the Emerald City. Now, along the yellow brick road, she meets some friends, and they become her traveling companions. And along the way, they face all kinds of obstacles, trees that throw apples, um, flying monkeys. Remember that? Flying monkeys. And a truly evil woman who rides around on a broomstick. And finally, towards the end of the movie, it appears as if Dorothy is going to make it home. In fact, the wizard himself is going to take her home because he has a hot air balloon. And so she gets inside the wicker basket and she's holding Toto and she's saying goodbye to all of her friends. And then Toto sees a cat. And Toto jumps out of her arms and runs after the cat. Now, Dorothy cannot leave the land of Oz without Toto, so she gets out of the basket to run after Toto, and in the confusion, they let go of the ropes, and there goes the hot air balloon without Dorothy in it. And just when you think Dorothy is going to have to spend the rest of her life in the land of Oz, a big bubble shows up. And it has Glinda. (laughs) Okay, now here, spoiler alert. Okay, spoiler alert. I'm going to blow it all for you right now. But listen, if you've not seen the movie, you've had 83 years to see the movie. So (laughs) if you've not seen it yet, that's on you. Um, Glinda tells Dorothy, Dorothy, you've had the power to go home the whole time. It's in the ruby slippers. All you have to do is click your heels and say there's no place like home three times and you'll be home. I'm surprised Dorothy doesn't slap Glinda at this point (laughs) because Glinda is the one who gave her the ruby slippers to begin with. And Dorothy went through so much drama Listen, had she known the whole time that she had the power in the ruby slippers, don't you think she just went to, I'm out of here, right? She would have gone home a long time. The whole movie, listen, had she known, we wouldn't have a movie because the whole movie is about her wanting to get home. I've wondered at times how many of us experience drama, unnecessary drama, simply because we live our lives unaware of the power available to us. So you cannot access the power of his presence if you live unaware of the reality of his presence. We have to come to a place where we recognize that there is a source of strength, a source of power beyond ourselves that is available to us to live the life that we're called to live. Now, you have a helper. Jesus sent you a helper. Jesus will be your experienced skipper, and he has sent you a helper. The Holy Spirit has come to help you what you cannot do in your own strength. So let me, as I wrap this up today, let me just give you a a handful of things Um, that the Holy Spirit does for us. Number one, he enables us to live God-honoring lives. He enables us to live God-honoring lives. We can't do that in our own strength. But look what it says here in John 16, 8. And when he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of coming judgment. He'll convict the world of sin. Let me just say conviction is a good thing. When you experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life, it's the Spirit of God pointing out what's wrong. 
But it doesn't just say he just convicts us. He actually convinces us of God's righteousness. In other words, he shows us what's right. He doesn't just point out what's wrong. He actually points us in the right direction so that we can decide to make a course adjustment. Look what it says in John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will guide you into all truth. He doesn't just point out what's wrong. He convinces you of what's right so that you can make a course adjustment, and he will lead you into all truth, and he will remind you of everything that the Father has said. What Jesus has said. Look what it says here in John 14, 26. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. So when the Spirit comes, convicts us of what's wrong, shows us what's right, begins to teach us what is true, helps us remember what Jesus said so that we can live our lives more like him, he's enabling us to live God-honoring lives. That's what the Holy Spirit does in us. Here's number two. He equips us to help others. And this is really important that we understand that God desires that we involve ourselves in one another's lives. Again, let me, let me just get back to what I said when I first uh, got started. You know, For those of you who are watching online, if you're in close proximity and if you're able to join us on the weekend, it's really critical because then you're able to mingle with people that God is going to bring into your life to help you. God has given each one of us gifts so that we can help each other on our journey. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Now, these are not just natural abilities. These are actual spiritual gifts that the, that the Spirit gives us. And he lists a whole bunch of them. Things like uh, wise advice, special knowledge, great um, faith, gifts of healing, ability to prophesy, spiritual discernment, speaking in an unknown tongue and the ability to interpret. All of these different gifts that he bestows on us. Look what it says in verse 11. It is the one and only spirit who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So it's not like these are things that we manufacture. These, these are not things that we just try to produce in, our, in ourselves. These are, these are gifts that he gives as he desires. He gives us spiritual gifts so that we can help each other. And then here's number three. He engages us on a life-transforming journey. Everyone is accepted right where they are. You don't have to get your act together to come to God. But God loves us too much to leave us where we are. He actually engages us on a life-transforming journey. We're in a spiritual battle. And we have a very real spiritual enemy who has a very different outcome that he wants us to experience. He wants to bring just death and destruction to our lives. In fact, in his letter to the Galatians, Paul gives a whole list of evidences that you've allowed your sinful nature to kind of lead the way in your life, okay? And he, and he lists a whole bunch of things, things like sexual sins, allowing things to become more important to us than God. It's called idolatry. He, he talks about the inability for us to get along with people where we're constantly experiencing this drama with other people. Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions. Maybe we're drinking more alcohol than we should. All kinds of things that are evidence to this idea that our spirit or our sinful nature is actually in control of us. 
But then he also provides evidences that we have yielded control of our lives to the Spirit of God. And, and look what it says here in Galatians 5, and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When those things are increasing in our lives, when we're growing in our capacity to love others, when we are joyful regardless of our circumstances, when we're patient with people, when we extend grace to others, when we're in situations that are pushing our buttons, but we're gentle and we're kind and we demonstrate self-control. These are all evidences that the Holy Spirit is actually helping us because these are not things that we can just produce on our own. These are not character traits that we just naturally come by. We have a sinful nature that if we kind of just take the path of least resistance, it's not gonna look like that. But when we say, God, I want your spirit, I want your presence in my life to take control, then these are the things that become more and more evident in our lives. I remember um, a while back, I, I was navigating a very difficult season. And I'd just come through probably one of the more difficult weeks of ministry. And I was very discouraged and I had been allowed to stay in this guest cottage that was located in the middle of this vineyard. It was a beautiful setting. The cottage was built up on a hill overlooking this vineyard that stretched out for miles. And in the morning I was sitting on the porch and I was enjoying a cup of coffee quite honestly, feeling down and discouraged. When I saw a bird soaring above the vineyard, and being from the Northwest, I recognized right away what it was. It was a bald eagle, huge bird, wings spread. It was not flapping. It had caught a thermal current and it was just soaring, it was circling, and it was going higher and higher and higher effortlessly. And then as I'm watching this eagle, a flock of ducks flew by, perfect V formation, and their wings were flapping furiously. Ah, 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 ah right across. When they got about midway across that vineyard, they were quite a ways away, about halfway between where I sat and the horizon. I looked back up at this eagle that had now soared to a height that made it hard to even find it in the sky, and I looked up just in time to see this eagle tuck and shoot across the sky like a rocket. In a matter of moments, it had surpassed the ducks. And then the Holy Spirit brought this verse to mind. Those that wait upon the Lord will find new strength. They will mount up on wings 
like eagles. They'll run and not get tired. They'll walk and not grow weary. And I felt the Holy Spirit ask me this question, Mike, do you want to be a duck or do you want to be an eagle? The eagle soared on the wind. The ducks made progress, but it was a lot of effort. And I had to admit in that moment, I had been working hard. And I said to the Lord, I want to be an eagle. I don't want to be a duck. I'm tired of doing this in my own strength. And maybe you are too. And I guess I want to close today by just simply asking the question, when it comes to your spiritual journey, when it comes to your relationship with Jesus, so many of us, try so hard to be a better Christian. We're what I'd call white-knuckled Christians. I'm gonna do this. I think what God wants us to do is to relax, recognize that you have a source of strength available to you that goes beyond your own human effort but we have to become more and more aware of his presence in our life if we're ever going to tap into the power of his presence. Does that make sense? So that's my prayer this morning, that we would become more and more aware of his presence, that we would recognize that Jesus doesn't expect us to do this alone, that he really wants to enable us and he has sent a helper for us so that we don't have to do this in our own strength. And look what this says here in Luke chapter 11. I'm gonna close with this. Luke 11, 11 through 13. Your fa you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you, sinful people, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Would you stand with me? Would you bow your heads and just close your eyes for a moment. Get real honest right now, will you? Just you and God. To what degree have you been relying on your own strength to try to live this life that Jesus has called us to? To what degree have you tapped into the source of power that's available to you and has been ever since you crossed the line of faith? The Holy Spirit of God, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, has actually taken up residency within you. So Father, this morning, we thank you for not only providing just excellent leadership in our lives, but providing us with an unexpected companion, this Holy Spirit that has come to help us. Father, forgive us for living our lives without recognizing your presence in our life always. And Father, I pray that as we leave here today and as we move on throughout our week and anticipate coming together again next week, 
God, may we recognize that we don't just meet you in a room like this with other believers, but that you said you would be with us always, you would never leave us or forsake us, you'd be with us to the very end. We have you as our helper forever. So Father, I pray that throughout this week, we become increasingly aware of your presence in our life and that we would stop trying to do this in our own strength and lean into yours. I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen.